thank you, uh, John and Anklaus, for inviting me to um, give this seminar. And as an introductory note to situate this research within a kind of broader research agenda, um, the cheeky title to this paper has long been Riding in Cars with Boys. So the story that I'm about to tell is at a, a quite fundamental level about a particular formation of heteromasculinity as a region forming process. So it's a kind of anthropological approach that looks at sex and gender. It's almost a complete inverse of my broader research, which is the basis of the book project, which is on microcredit development projects and that sort of financial femininity um, that they create. So today we're talking about boys. Uh, my broader research talks about women and credit. So we get to see the, the flip side of the story here. So most of my fieldwork contacts in Paraguay reacted to my battered 1970s Volkswagen Beetle, featured here, with raised eyebrows. The car, in short, was a mechanical disaster on wheels. How I came to drive the Fusca, which these Brazilian manufactured Volkswagen Beetles are popularly called, is also part of a bigger story about the moving connections of commercial trade, smuggling, and legal regulation in Paraguay. Since the border city of Ciudad del Este is a crucial bottleneck for contraband in the continent, the movement of cars from duty-free ports of sale to uh, sales lots to traffic jams on and across the Paraguayan border illustrate how local regulatory practices are scaled. Uh, Ciudad del Este uh, is a city of about 350,000 people on the Paraguayan side of the triple frontier with Argentina and Brazil. You sort of might see it here on the border with Puerto Iguazu across the border and the small tourist town of Puerto Iguazu. Uh, down here. So that, kind of broadly, the tri-border region. Uh, it was founded in 1957 as a project of high modernism and also commercial connection with the economies of Paraguay's vastly larger neighbors, officially acquiring duty-free status in 1971. So the infrastructural reconstruction of urban space in places such as Ciudad del Este and Brasilia, after which it was modeled, um, sought to replace the pedestrian with the car. In fact, the international bridge spanning the Paraná River, which you can see under construction here, was completed before the city was even populated. It was literally a bridge to nowhere. Car culture was built into the city itself, and with it, a series of puzzles over how to govern this mechanical crowd. Tellingly, the Fusca was unusual in Ciudad del Este, and not just because of its quaint vintage flair and clattering motor. It was also unusual because of its place within a hierarchy of legal regulations that document and account for Paraguay's vast vehicle fleet, or Parque Automotor, as they say in Paraguay. So this talk, broadly, will explore the routes opened up and closed off by the regulation of Paraguay's vehicle fleet and its shadows. Now, as I sought out advice about buying a car in 2009 at the start of my long-term field work in Ciudad del Este, I was warned repeatedly of the perils of Paraguay's shadow fleet, locally denominated Autos Mao. The legal travails of President Luis González Maki, who governed Paraguay from 1999 to 2003, were used on several occasions as a cautionary tale. In 2001, the luxury car that had been acquired by the Paraguayan government for the president was impounded and declared illegal by state prosecutors. So in a nutshell, the scandal erupted when prosecutors discovered that the paperwork had been legalized, legalizado, by the government's official notary public when the office of the president had authorized its sale, um, or sorry, its purchase for $81,000. Gonzalez Maki's vice president and political rival, Julio Cesar Franco, went on the record as saying, quote, Nobody can say because my neighbor has an illegal car. As president of the republic, I also have the right to one too. And the story was re-narrated to me uh, about a decade later as I just discovered just how difficult it was to actually buy a legal car. The legitimacy of cars and their accompanying titles, registration, documentation, um, continue to frame discussion of contraband in Paraguay today. Now colloquially, Paraguayans have a phrase to describe precisely this regulatory gray area, mao. Mao is an adjective that is sometimes said to originate in a phrase in Guarani. Other times is attributed to the Brazilian phrase for bad, mal. 
In effect, it glosses all sorts of irregularities, such as those in the Gonzalez Maki case. At times, mal means illegal and illicit. Sometimes it means simply informal or unregulated or in defiance of regulation. And other times it evokes illegal but licit or sanctioned activity. Some even say that there is a distinction within the term for altos mal itself, with mal mal cars denoting contraband cars that don't have any sort of documentation, which are contrasted to simply mal cars that are also contraband but have been partially nationalized within Paraguay. And to give a sense of how central this issue is, as of 2011, there were thought to be at least 100,000 Mao cars in the shadow fleet. And this is in a country of 6.5 million people, right? So we're talking like a pretty big phenomenon here. So the broader aim of this talk is to explore how Mao cars, as a mechanical crowd, that is condensed in particular political legal bottlenecks, which, I argue, are key to region formation in the tri-border area. In order to understand the emergence of Ciudad del Este as a regional phenomenon, I'm going to discuss a couple of colorful figures in Paraguay's car trade. A customs dispatch agent and an elite customs force, task force. Their ability to profit from these bottlenecks is caught up in broader debates about commercial capitalism in the hemisphere. So, first part of the talk. Doing business with a personal fleet. This is Ciudad del Este on the, uh, the Paraguayan side of the duty free zone. Daniel, a customs dispatch agent working and living on the Brazilian side of the triple frontier, so across the bridge from the Mona Lisa, he offered a running commentary uh, of the specificities of car nationalization every time we met. His long term girlfriend worked in the financial services industry in Ciudad del Este and I had been in nearly daily contact with her as part of my broader research on microfinance. So Daniel, in fact, was pretty hard to miss, rocking up as he did in a fire engine red Subaru WRX Impressa rally car. Between the uh, 265 horses under the hood and the subwoofer that occupied two thirds of the trunk space, we could hear him coming two blocks away. Well, Daniel's collection of personal cars facilitated his free movement across the border. It also implied inventory that was fixed and immobile, a business model that generated value from patients. His daily work of deal making hinged on his ability to wait and keep the cars in his personal fleet so he could sell them at a profit. The condensed mobilities of vehicle stockpiles are a theme that I will return to in this talk. Now, tellingly, in his early 50s and a Brazilian national, Daniel said that he did negociados, or deal making, for a living. From what he described to me of his business ventures, he made his modest fortune in import export logistics. So, none of the half dozen odd cars he had at any given time were zero kilometer or brand new, but they were all stylish. And they were all nominally for sale. In the interim, they were his personal fleet. As I later found in informal interviews, most of his used cars were caught up in his wider business dealings. He also operated informal credit and lending. Uh, many times he accepted these vehicles to collateralize loans or for payment on a debt. He lived in the Brazilian city of Foz de Iguaçu, but imported the cars over to Paraguay, then resold them to clients in Brazil and Argentina. So he positioned himself at the center of a highly networked web of finance, vehicles, laws, uh, and laws that saturated, or one might argue produced, the border as region. So the work of customs dispatch agents like Daniel was made especially lucrative by the complex documentation procedures to turn mal cars into legitimately licensed vehicles in Paraguay, and which could then be resold across the border in Brazil and Argentina. Paraguayan law mandated a dispatch agent to handle the paperwork and negotiate a price for duty. So this was written into the law itself. There had to be an intermediary. And as I learned more about the Paraguayan vehicle registry, I discovered an early push to this, do the, precisely this sort of documentation to nationalize all of the contraband cars beginning in 1995. However, the new law was immediately beset with amendments then, uh, that postponed and delayed its effects. In fact, a special and transitory registry was set up to issue so-called brown titles for vehicles that had been physically brought across the border uh, but had never been legally imported. So this is the issue that Gonzalez Maki's uh, car had run into. 
these Mao titles were differentiated from green titles or cedula verde that were issued by the normal registry. So although the special and transitory registry was initially thought of as a sort of stopgap measure um, through the nationalization process, uh, it was actually reauthorized again and again and again in 1998, in 2001, in 2002, in 2004, and now continues to exist as a parallel registry for Mao cars. There's two separate registry systems. Uh, they offer two different classes of documents. So with this complex legal framework as a backdrop, I was not surprised when Daniela's first question put to me was, can I see your cedula? Now, handing over the Fusca's green ID card, Daniel turned it over and over, he's feeling the lamination between his fingers, like scrutinizing it closely. He ventured that I must have paid a fortune for the Fusquinha since it was not a Mao car. Most Vida bugs, he told me, were imported illegally from Brazil, where they were manufactured up until the 1990s. We can see many such vehicles populating the streets of Ciudad de las Deas. It was just being built in the 1970s, 1980s. Now, these cars ended up in Paraguay as part of the shadow fleet of unlicensed Mao cars with brown titles. In his view, there was an apparent mismatch between the above board and legitimate documentation of my Fusca and the material form of the car itself, which he readily attributed to the smuggling economy. Now, in Daniel's telling of the stock narrative of contraband cars, Fuscas had quite often been reported stolen in Brazil so their owners could cash in on the auto insurance. Now, and in fact, there was whole kind of bands of casacoches that were on the border to steal cars and then import them to Paraguay with the kind of being fully condoned by their owners um, who are then able to cash in on the full market value. Now, from, this, um, from his perspective, uh, Daniel's perspective, situated as he was within a regional car market that seeped across national borders, Daniel located the shadow fleet beyond Paraguay, even as Mao cars made their way onto the um, Ciudad del Este market. When I told him sheepishly that I had paid 1,800 US dollars for the Fusca, which I considered scandalously high at the time because this car was really a bucket of bolts, he nodded knowingly and instead of chastising me, he observed, you know, half the price you pay is for the documentation to be able to cross the border. That's what makes the car so expensive. Now, looking at my vehicle registration card again, he added, you know, this one's pretty good. It looks old and worn enough it might actually be real. You know, the next thing you have to do is get it transferred to your name. About 85 bucks at the registry ought to do it. Any more than that, they're ripping you off. So apparently the labor of deal making or negociado extended to the national registry as well, not just the spe special and transitory registry. So despite the fact that Autos Mao is a category that accommodates a wide range of car documentation, ownership, and registration arrangements, my friends and colleagues were very concerned that I get a car that had been fully licensed by the vehicle registry and had that coveted cedula verde. Their central concern was for the legi legitimacy of my car's documents, a focus that I found, found especially puzzling in light of the number of times they had to come rescue me when the Fusca had a mechanical crisis and left me stranded on the side of the road. More often than not, it meant recruiting somebody to come out and help give it a push start, heaving the car into motion as I popped the clutch into first gear to restart the engine. Now, for me, the puzzle of why my friends exhorted me to get a car that would be able to freely circulate within Paraguay and beyond because of its cedula, while at the same time also having endless patience with the near constant breakdowns that left me stuck on the side of the road, I think went to the heart of Ciudad de la Sé's complex valuation practices that focus on transborder commerce as an engine of wealth in the city. And while I was never I've never been stopped uh, at Paraguay's border with Argentina and Brazil. I have frequently been pulled over at police checkpoints within the city of Ciudad del Este in Paraguay, which usually involved more or less subtle bribe seeking. I would hand over the vehicle registration, the ID card, my Paraguayan driver's license. Um, and often I had a Paraguayan passenger. They would often let out an audible sigh of relief when we were waved through the checkpoint after all of our documents checked out. Now, in one instance, uh, the police looked at me suspiciously and asked sharply, what was I doing here? Why was I driving in Paraguay at all? What brought me here anyway? My co-pilot turned to me indignantly after the police, finally satisfied with my answers, waved us through and we got back on the road. 
What right does he have to ask that, she challenged. That's not right, you know. He has no reason to ask, uh, to ask you why you're here. But in effect, he did have every right to question my identity, since the identity and nationality of the car owner was one of the key mediating material relationships um, that produced this pile of documents I had just handed over to him. And indeed, the three-way material connection between driver, object, and document was part of what made police checkpoints particularly fraught. In the question, but what gives you the right to drive this vehicle, the you and the this were both only tenuously linked by the indexical relationship between the document and the things it pointed to. Because it was itself under suspicion because of the black box deal making that was the inevitable precondition of the cedula, whether it was green or brown, since negociado went to the heart of this whole process. Okay, so now that we're done with Daniel, I'm going to move on to the second half of the paper. Hunting mafiosi in crowded car parks. So on one hand, the central role of people like Daniel intermediating the National Registry extended many of the forms of private accumulation enabled by cars, from credit and financing, to cars as commodities, to the entrepreneurial labor of market arbitrage. On the other hand, the registry's efforts to account for the parque automotor, the whole vehicle fleet, as a totality, offered avenues for expanded bureaucratic authority. In fact, the endemic contraband in the car market gave the officials in charge of the vehicle fleet leverage to use their authority to investigate smuggling more broadly. So this was kind of their way into uh, the smuggling economy. And returning to the condensed mobilities of stockpiles, the crowded sales lot, especially in Ciudad del Este's specially licensed uh, free trade zones, these became a powerful metaphor for unencumbered trade as a particular legal, uh, political legal distributional order in Paraguay. So suspicion about the private negotiation between customs dispatch agents and the state uh, has actually fueled a series of expansions within the customs bureaucracy itself. So figures precisely like Daniel, who made his fortune on intermediating uh, those legal, um, legal processes. In an interview in 2009 with Osvaldo, who was the director of the customs office's specialized technical unit, or UTE, charged with investigating and prosecuting uh, smuggling in Paraguay's import sector, he immediately steered the conversation towards the difficulty of curbing mafias that controlled the used car trade. In his words, Paraguay is a mafia's dream, el sueño de mafiosos. Now, unlike Daniel's stylish apartment in Brazil and gleaming collection of fast cars, Osvaldo worked out of a dim office in one of the anonymous concrete uh, buildings that made up the centers of governance in Asuncion. With a single wooden desk and a sparse office furniture, the central office of this specialized technical unit, uh, it's a very fancy title, but kind of grim office, uh, gave little hint of the complex operations police investigations, inter international connections that Osvaldo enthusiastically just described to me as the basis for uh, his policing mandate. So Osvaldo's categorical claim that Paraguay is the mafia's dream hinged on the crowded car parks that line the highway in the kilometers leading up to Ciudad del Este. This is an early photo of uh, the specially licensed duty-free zones that uh, came into being after Paraguay was uh, the city of Ciudad del Este was given um, a special mandate to arrange um, import-export licenses uh, through these specially controlled um, duty-free zones. So they're each operated by a different company. And these big balcones, these big warehouses, um, can import kind of any number of goods, from cars to um, personal electronics, clothes, etc. And because they're privately controlled, they become a port of entry themselves. Um, and nowadays, you know, years later, after this was taken, um, there's kind of huge car parks, too, with all the cars that have been imported. So Osvaldo's categorical claim that Paraguay is the mafia's dream hinged on exactly these um, kind of car parks. How, he asked, with rhetorical flourish, can there be so many goods for sale that don't move? In his analysis, quote, if there's, a if there's a surplus of supply, then naturally the market would compensate and prices on used vehicles would come down. But instead, 
the cars stay in the lot and high prices, uh, at high prices, and indeed, more are imported every day. He concluded that any normal business would not be able to withstand it, no podría aguantar. For Osvaldo, a licit and normal business would not be able to wait on that inventory, he was not offering any returns on investment, stuck in the lot. His analysis made a fluid jump to wider contraband economies, as he concluded that, quote, for them, it's a matter of laundering money. So the capital goods are cars that are then used to clean the money up. So cars became the focus of the UTA's wing of the customs office because Osvaldo, much like Daniel, concluded that cars uh, are widely purchased with illegal money and then undervalued in the customs office through corruption and bribery. The used car dealerships could sit on the investment because it didn't cost them anything to have the inventory waiting to be sold. Crowded car parks became a powerful metaphor for the contraband trade itself. Leaning back in his chair, Osvaldo summarized his take on illegality at, in the used car market as a closed loop animating the logic of the car park. They bring, in his words, they bring black capital here, and that's how they launder money. That's what's behind the oversupply. If that was clean capital, it wouldn't stay there like that on the lot. Importantly, the materiality of the crowded car park, the crowded lots, further allowed Osvaldo to, through the work of his special um, technical unit, materialize a repertoire of other economic practices, like money laundering and smuggling. It gave him a lens to see them, or at least so he thought. Driving by the warehouses and enclosed private compounds that have been licensed with special custom zone status, that fence around um, the lot, I would often pass what seemed like acres of parked motor vehicles. Aligned in neat rows, the cars range from vintage Porsches that had been imported to compact Japanese models that would make their way onto the market. They were always on the other side of a locked gate, often with a discrete sign identifying the limited liability company that had been licensed to operate that particular duty-free zone. Rather than customs as the state's interlocutor, private sector businesses took custody of the vehicle while negotiating its sale. The car parks were a visible reminder of that labor but simultaneously worked to conceal the web of financial intermediation that helped the negociado, the deal-making, take shape. Now this, in turn, gave credence to the metaphorical link of crowded car parks and the mafia's broad base, as articulated by state agents, such as Osvaldo. Okay, so by way of conclusion, uh, I want to briefly touch on one way that the pent-up dynamics of car stockpiles, which I've described here as condensed mobilities, are set free to circulate in Ciudad del Este. They don't always live behind the fence. Uh, and one way that they were set free was cruising in Ciudad del Este. So cruising is semi-anarchic processions of cars that slowly promenade um, on spontaneously agreed upon routes it's a near ubiquitous pastime, uh, nocturnal pastime in Ciudad del Este, That's caravanas that kind of go throughout the city. So the combination of high modernism in the city's urban design, which you can see here, um, plus transborder commercial rhythm that turns most of Ciudad del Este into a complete ghost town by 4 p.m. when the businesses close, <laughs> means that local discotheques, clubs, restaurants, and bars, such as they are, exist in far-flung pockets of uh, residential suburbs, so not anywhere you would want to go um, at night, really. For young people living in the Paraguayan side of the border, the net effect is that a good night out instead involves joining one of the many slow-moving streams of vehicles, decked out with fabulous sound systems, blasting bootleg copies of top 40 hits, and complete with private party space within the cab as they wound their way through the residential streets of Ciudad del Este. So in contrast to the homogeneity of car stockpiles, the crowded car parks of mafioso's dreams, or even Daniel's ever-changing personal inventory uh, of cars, a sort of biomechanical diversity flourished in Ciudad del Este. These are a set of practices that reject patients or condensed mobility. As that is the basis for accumulation in Ciudad del Este's commercial economy. If you can have patience, Daniel and Osvaldo agreed, you can profit from the law and enact value transformations across legal regimes. 
Cruising shows no such restraint and indeed actively flaunts it. Instead, cruising cultivates an aesthetic of embellishment, of personalization, of continuous DIY modification and investment. From the constant hunt for flashier rims to personalized paint jobs to custom made subwoofers, lovingly crafted to fit perfectly into the cavity of a car. Cruising culture thrives on self-created bottlenecks focused entirely on the Paraguayan side of the triple frontier. So what can this tell us um, about region formation and um, the triple frontier? So the larger commercial bottlenecks of the juridical political regulatory regime of the tri-border area. So what makes these kind of particular laws, <clears throat> the duty-free status, um, and uh, the two different car registries, and et cetera. So this very kind of particular um, juridical political regulatory regime. And we also have the kind of meta bottleneck of the crowded car parks that profited from them. Uh, these were the enabling conditions of cruising as a specific and localized route through those bottlenecks and entirely within Paraguay. The two points I want to draw out of this for discussion as we kind of open this up. First, while studies of neoliberalization have emphasized how ideals of laissez-faire free markets have been conjoined to ever-hardening security measures and surveillance of political borders, the condensed mobilities of Paraguay's altos mal show that bottlenecks are themselves a scaled phenomenon, which articulate across the regulatory field of commercial capitalism. And second, these bottlenecks enable and foreclose a whole host of mobilities, from the growth instead of the movement of parked cars, to the moving temporalities of deferral and patience, to the self-created routes and bottlenecks of cruising. So value transformations across those regimes of mobility are key to creating the region itself. Thanks. That's a really great question, especially um, as part of the, the broader project um, is about the formations of masculinity that are enabled by not just cruising, but kind of all of these forms of um, kind of car culture, right? From the um, kind of like hyper um, heteromasculine um, aesthetics of Danielle's personal fleet um, to Osvaldo's. Um, kind of like guns and police raids um, project of a sort of um, kind of state agent, uh, masculinized state agent. Um, cruising was, was also um, sexualized, but in kind of Paraguayan, um, at least in Ciudad del Este, um, in a kind of very normative um, heterosexual formations of sexuality, um, especially since, as you can see with a lot of these cars, um, they're kind of private club spaces where you can um, have your lady friends along in contexts where often um, you live with your parents until your kind of mid-30s to early 40s. So the escape in the car becomes this kind of tenuous shell that encases you as you kind of move throughout the city, but also um, offers some modicum of privacy uh, so that um, you can have fun in the car. I think that um, the kind of slippages that are enabled by that kind of mobility um, are really interesting. So I'm curious to kind of think more broadly about what sort of formations of gender are being produced um, in uh, the bottleneck of cruising versus the kind of other sort of bottlenecks that we see. Um, it's a kind of a good thing to kind of keep thinking about. Also of interest, um, for me is the, um, the close connection between the kind of biomechanical diversity of cars and the people who ride in them, right? So if working on cars um, in kind of Australia and America feels like a very kind of masculine project, um, in Paraguay, the kind of embellishment culture of the cars actually opens up lots of avenues for kind of play with different forms of um, gender identity and um, formations of um, kind of aesthetic, the embodied aesthetics of gender. So um, that also is a kind of a way into to that question. But even in the last kind of three, four years since this long-term study took place, 
um, Brazilian surveillance at that border has um, become ever more kind of, yeah, it's hardening ever more. Uh, so the kind of trade, the money and goods that go through the city uh, is down to a kind of a slow trickle. And that has enormous implications, not just for um, the people who profit from um, the movement of the car trade, but even the kind of women who took microfinance loans to smart, start small businesses and move kind of petty trade um, across the border. There's a, a local phrase um, called contrabanda de hormigas, ant contraband, uh, where women in particular um, take kind of small parcels of goods and walk them back and forth um, across the border. Uh, and since that's becoming all the more difficult, um, Ciudad de la Cia has really kind of lost a lot of the commercial vibrancy um, that we kind of associate with it. However, the car trade still remains uh, kind of a, a really a real pillar of the commercial economy. So one uh, thing that I've noticed as this has kind of moved is that lo there's long been um, a kind of gender dimension to who can profit from the border. The kind of men like Daniel, who are import-export um, specialists and can harness the legal regimes to work for their benefit, uh, aren't going to be impacted as much by the tightening of border controls. Whereas the contrabando de hormigas, which is a very embodied uh, vulnerability of walking across this bridge with smuggled contraband, puts women at risk of being interdicted by Brazilian customs officials all the more. So an already kind of unequal distribution of wealth has widened um, as the Brazilian customs regime has tightened. I should also note that kind of these kind of questions sort of ebb and or the, the regulatory uh, frameworks kind of ebb and flow. Paraguay has had um, duty-free status since uh, 1971. And in that period, Brazil and Argentina have undergone kind of massive um, kind of state shifts in how they approach of import substituting industrialization, some kind of market openings, um, control of different aspects of the economy, especially now kind of trying to build up a, um, a national kind of electronics and engineering um, sector means that spaces like Ciudad del Este that are channeling goods from um, Taiwan and Korea and China are seen as um, all the more disruptive. So part of this has to do with kind of a bigger story about regional kind of dynamics and trade. But I think that you make a really kind of good point that the sort of local dynamics of inequality can be, they're kind of scaled to those big shifts, but also um, not quite in the ways that we might necessarily predict unless you look from the bottom up and see, for instance, how something as mundane as the car registry actually kind of stays quite stable over time, whereas these other flows uh, tend to shift. You know, a lot of this is about Daniel trying to kind of produce himself as that kind of entrepreneur or to kind of like give the, the image of um, the freewheeling frontier capitalist, whereas you know, his business model, um, which is tied into these really dense um, like loan finance agreements, of course, are like, deeply regulated in the sense that it's a personal network. Debts have their own kind of temporalities that regulate when and how and under what conditions you can sell any of that inventory. Uh, and his, even his kind of work of negociado, since that's about kind of interpersonal deal making within the registry, that's built into like the registry itself where you have to kind of like go and negotiate with the customs dispatch agent. It's not you know, where you say, okay, the car's worth $10,000. This is the price, the import duty that I want to pay. There is no kind of standard import duty. Every single one is negotiated in a kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, basis, and that's in the law itself. So like absolutely kind of highly regulated. I think that what I find really interesting is that um, it's actually the customs office that's kind of parasitic on that image that Danielle presents of the being the, the kind of freewheeling frontier capitalist in order to expand their own kind of bureaucratic authority by kind of saying that, oh, this is a mafia's dream, that there's all this money moving around, we don't know how it's going, um, there's the shadow fleet, and uh, we see it in these car parks, it's all about laundering money. Um, they're kind of harnessing Danielle's kind of flashy image of the entrepreneur in order to expand the customs office itself. So on the one hand, we see uh, what seems like kind of laissez-faire unregulated markets. On the other hand, that, that very kind of image of deregulation is what bolsters uh, 
the Paraguayan Customs Office's own claims to kind of state authority. So hardening regulation on the, or expanded regulation on the one hand is feeding off of this kind of image of deregulation on the other hand. It goes kind of hand in glove. So um, I think that comparing um, Daniel's, to, Daniel's work to um, the petty street vendors who were kind of hanging out in, um, in Ciudad del Este is really apropos since they're both kind of working within these dense networks. Um, and then to kind of think about how that image is ported elsewhere, um, I think it's really kind of an interesting um, kind of mismatch between the reality of the work and uh, what it's seen to do um, in other scales. Question. And for those who are not regional specialists, Mercosur is the um, kind of regional trading block um, in Latin America's southern cone. So I should go back to the map. Um, that's sort of like a um, like a NAFTA of um, of South America. Um, so yeah, Argentina, one reason that it's not mentioned is because the kind of larger paper deals um, with the Casa Coches, the kind of car, the bands of car thugs um, and thieves um, on the Brazilian side and the Argentinian side that have, based on um, the kind of different currency valuations, found it more lucrative to work in Argentina or in Brazil. So these kind of roving bands of um, car thieves will kind of pop back and forth across this border uh, in order to kind of steal the cars and then sell them back on the Paraguayan market. So uh, the kind of story of um, how the Fuscas end up in Paraguay is absolutely tied to the kind of regional dynamics of, um, of the kind of Mercosur area. One reason why Argentina doesn't figure quite as prominently in this particular story is that uh, the way that the border is kind of spatially laid out. There's the city of Ciudad del Este on the Paraguayan side, and that big bridge that goes over to Fos de Guasu on the Brazilian side. And that's where the main kind of conduit of commerce is. And there's not actually a direct connection between Paraguay and Argentina. There's another bridge that goes across a different river from Fos de Guasu to Puerto Iguazu in, um, in Argentina. But the main kind of conduit for smuggling uh, between Argentina and um, Paraguay is kind of a little bit farther up the river where there's a, an actual bridge where, um, where they can cross. So that sort of triangular movement of goods from kind of Argentina first to Brazil and then over to Paraguay or from Paraguay to Brazil and then over to Argentina is usually kind of intermediated by boat trades, these skiffs that go back and forth across the river if you really want to smuggle something to Argentina. And cars are something that's difficult to kind of put on a skiff and get across the river. So uh, within the kind of broader smuggling economy, both Argentina and Brazil are important markets for uh, the movement of, kind of semi-licit goods back and forth from Ciudad del Este kind of elsewhere. But in the car trade, at least when, as I was talking to these guys, uh, they made it seem as though Brazil, at least right now in the late 2000s, was the kind of the place the, where they were having the biggest deals. And uh, part of that had to do simply with the kind of regional infrastructure of getting cars back and forth across. As far as kind of how they were talking about um, the bigger Mercosur context, um, it's interesting, like now that um, you kind of invite me to think about this, um, are really interesting that they kind of talk about it in terms of particular routes, not in terms of uh, kind of regional formation. So one of the other big ports of entry into Latin America through Iquique in, um, in Chile. So Paraguayans would sometimes drive all the way to that duty-free port in Chile and then truck the cars back over to Paraguay, nationalize them in Paraguay, and then sell them kind of elsewhere because the legal arbitrage made sense for them to do that. So they talk about these kind of larger scale movements and regulatory projects in terms of kind of ways through them, right? Or they talk about the route that you have to take to Sao Paulo in order to kind of get your, the car that you've nationalized in Paraguay, um, have it for sale in Sao Paulo. So it was a kind of a micro-level analysis of Mercosur through these particular bottlenecks rather than as a kind of regional kind of political formation, which I think is telling that like those bottlenecks are actually what's producing the region and the imaginaries of uh, even kind of state agents who are in charge of kind of producing this or kind of enforcing exactly this sort of legal framework. Um, they call it tuning, if you want to like tune your car. Um, I think 
Probably because um, the first thing that you do if you have a little bit of money and want to work on your car is put the biggest speakers you can possibly find, right? Um, so there's a, like a whole aftermarket for car kind of work and car labor um, that goes along with this, which is a very kind of, it's locali localized on the Paraguayan side, partly because um, kind of labor is much less expensive in Paraguay than in Brazil and Argentina because of these kind of bigger um, trade dynamics. Um, so if you want to have someone build you the best subwoofer there is, um, it will be in Paraguay, and um, it will be kind of tuned. You'll be tuning your car. <laughs>